CII Radio, the media voice with a global footprint. Tune in now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the Sunset Expedition on the Saturday evening, all the way here in Durban. Yes, my name is Rahana Baraji Khan, keeping you company till 8 o'clock tonight. Now, we all have been hearing over the uh, over the past couple of days and, of course, the past week about the Uyghur week that we've been having, constant updates about what is going on and, of course, the situation in Uyghur as well, how things are really, really getting, to, I would say, from bad to worse on a daily basis. Now, talking to us, I do have a guest Nuri Turkal, who is an attorney in Washington, D.C., specializing in a wide range of legal issues, including aviation, trade and investment, immigration, uh, legislative uh, advocacy, as well as regulatory compliance, focusing on anti-bribery investigation and enforcement. And in addition to his law practice, Turkal, Turkal serves as chairman of the board for the Uyghur Human Rights Project, that is the UHRP, in Washington, D.C., which works on Uyghur human rights research and documentation projects. Now, this gentleman is indeed a very, uh, a very well-known, of course, and also he is a husband, father, attorney, rights advocate, cycling enthusiast, and American of Uyghur heritage. And to talk to us, about the current situation in Uyghur right now, we want to say assalamu alaikum and welcome to Channel Islam International on the Saturday evening. Walaikum well, assalam. Thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate the kind introduction. <laughs> All right. So um, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. It's Nuri Turkal. Yes, you have. Okay. Wonderful. All right, let's let's get right yeah, into it. I know that you work, of course, very closely now. You um, you know you are on the board for the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Let's talk about current situation right now in Uyghur. Um, first of all, greetings to your audience, and, and thank you so much for your interest, uh, bringing more light, shedding more light on the. Uh, humanitarian crisis facing the Uyghur people uh, in East Turkestan that the Uyghurs proudly call their homeland. Uh, it's very difficult to put together a, a, a sentence or two to describe the ongoing onslaught against Uyghur's ethnic identity and centuries-old Islamic faith. Uh, if I may, I will use uh, an imaginary way to uh, describe uh, the 21st century ethnic cleansing taking place on our watch. Imagine that you get up one morning, try to go to the mosque for your morning, morning prayer, and you're stopped by police, and you're forced to go through iris scan. You're forced to surrender your phone for data scanning, and you're forced to show identification. At some po- and in some instances, you need to show your barcode that the government established on your identity. And once you walk into the, uh, you made through this process, process, you walk into the mosque, you sit down, and facing uh, the Qibla, uh, try to pray to Allah, you end up praising the Communist Party, praising the current uh, president of China, Xi Jinping, and in a way that you uh, condemn and, uh, and renounce, uh, condemn and, and the, uh, crit- criticize or join the criticism of uh, not government-approved uh, religious sermons. So basically the Chinese government, uh, using its state-sanctioned uh, in, in the Chinese version of uh, Islam, to change the centuries of practices. This is what is happening in the religious front. And culturally, uh, anything that Uyghur people cherishes, uh, such as uh, wearing Uyghur clothes, 
mm. speaking Uyghur language, uh, preference uh, to marry a Uyghur individual, and raising Uyghur uh, children in a Uyghur culture uh, has been seen as a tumor uh, in an ideological front. So in other words, the Chinese government treats uh, Uyghur ethnic identity as a tumor and religious belief as a mental disease. So this is, this is, a, uh, it, this is uh, what is happening in the recent weeks and recent months. Uh, but historically, uh, since the Chinese took over the Uyghurs' homeland with the help of Stalin in 1949, the Uyghurs got, uh, have gone through a very different period. Um, in the last 60-some years, uh, the Uyghurs, uh, Uyghur situation has gotten really, really worse. Uh, some people like to compare what the Chinese doing uh, is to an Orwellian society. Uh, I think the accurate way to portray it is, uh, in my mind, is Orwellian society on steroid. And, you know, when you look at the uh, Western media coverage, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in the last four or five months, you would be amazed how accurately the, um, uh, the current situation has been uh, described in parallel to South African uh, apartheid, uh, mm -hmm. Jim Crow laws in the United States, Japanese internment in the United States, uh, Nazi Germany, uh, Stalin's squad, so all of the uh, despicable uh, and regrettable part of human history in the 20th, 20th century have been likened to the ongoing humanitarian crisis uh, that many legal scholars and China experts, uh, foreign policy experts, respected journalists, journalists have uh, portrayed as ethnic cleansing and the cultural genocide. So uh, the Uyghur people, in short, uh, and if I can summarize, the Uyghur people have been criminalized for who they are, for being a Uyghur and for practicing Islamic faith that they have been uh, adhering to at least since 12th, 13th century, could be even earlier. Mm. My next question was actually going to be, you know, how long has this oppression been going on for? And you mentioned from 1949. 49, to be exact. Yes. Um, the Chinese, uh, the Uyghurs had a two short-lived uh, independent state. Uh, the first one is called uh, East Turkestan Islamic Republic, centered in, um, in Kashgar, which is my hometown where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. In 1933, they built a uh, uh, deeply religious and yet uh, secular government. And then uh, in 1944, the Uyghur, Uyghur, uh, the Uyghur ancestors built, uh, established the second East Turkestan Republic uh, in the northern part of the country. But five years later, Stalin, Stalin's Soviet Union feel threatened by the re-emergence of a Turkic nation on his backyard. And the, the civil war ended in China uh, between the nationalist and communist uh, Chinese. Mm -hmm. So the Stalin thought that uh, the Mazdaan would be a much more reliable ally uh, whose interests will be much more in the same way as the Soviet Union. So he basically uh, delivered the Uyghurs' homeland, East Turkestan, to Communist China, or Mao's China in 1949, on silver, sil silver platter. Mm -hmm. So ever since the Uyghurs uh, starting to lose out in political, economic, and social front. Mm. So if you look at the history from 1949 through the Cultural Revolution, is not one period where the Chinese uh, uh, Mao's China purged the Uyghur wealthy individuals, intellectuals, uh, uh, community leaders, uh, former soldiers who served in the East Turkestan Republic is very heavy-handed. 
even myself, uh, being the son of um, a, a wonderful woman who happened to be related to uh, a historic uh, family uh, who had that has a uh, very active history in a uh, Uyghur uh, political movement. So I was even born in the uh, uh, similar concentration camps that mm-hmm. the China calls the education mm-hmm. camp today. So the history is, is repeating itself in a um, uh, strange way, uh, mm-hmm. if I may. So, um, so it, after the Cultural Revolution, the Uyghur society got into a, a little bit of a loosened up uh, uh, situation. Uh, particularly under this uh, uh, moderate, liberal-minded Chinese leader, Hu Yaobang, who mm-hmm. was then a party secretary uh, who died in 1989 that resulted in the pro-democracy movement in Tiananmen Square. So uh, during his, um, in his administration, uh, or during his uh, ruling, the Uyghurs enjoyed certain level of uh, cultural freedom, religious freedom, and yet the uh, political... Um, uh, freedom was lacking uh, uh, for the most part, even that losing up period. So, and then uh, he died post uh, post Tiananmen uh, movement. Uh, we saw the emergency of uh, former Soviet Union, uh, Turkic Republic that we know as a country, such as uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan, and the others. Uh, that have historic and cultural uh, affinity to the Uyghur people. And the Chinese all of a sudden in the mid-90s decided to uh, wage what's called a strike-hard campaign to squelch the Mm -hmm. Uyghur political resentment uh, in consideration of uh, Uyghurs might be demanding political freedom like uh, the ones in former Soviet Union, uh, mm-hmm. granting a political freedom, or uh, we'll loosening up some of the restrictions. Uh, the Communist Party may uh, collapse like the one in Moscow uh, mm-hmm. back in the, uh, in the late part, part of the Cold War. So for better or worse, Chinese uh, started to concern uh, that its its fate will be the same as the uh, the Soviets. So and then the Uyghurs become a casualty of that uh, self created uh, imaginary enemy or fear on the survival of the Communist Party. Mm-hmm. But when you think of it in a human term, it's pretty sickening. Uh, the world yes. is is moving towards liberalization. Mm-hmm. We saw several uh, liberal democracies merged, um, uh, even countries like South Africa becoming to uh, a, a, a emerging as a, a kind of model, uh, model democracies uh, mm-hmm. as, as being the former colony. So, you know, the entire world is seeing some dramatic change, and yet the Chinese uh, decided to go the other way, the opposite mm-hmm. direction. So the, yes. to their benefit, uh, some uh, radical people chose to uh, pick a fight with the United States, uh, and, 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 and the 9-11 happened. Mm-hmm. And before 9-11, China never used a war terrorism to portray the Uyghurs' uh, political aspiration or demand for uh, social freedom. And uh, the 9-11 uh, U.S.-led uh, war on terrorism, that term in of itself is very problematic that I have a lot of issues with. Um, mm-hmm. The United States launched this uh, war uh, that is perceived as a war on Islam in many uh, societies. And then the Chinese all of a sudden uh, use this as, as an opportunity, one, to tell the uh, Western countries that they are also, the Chinese also, a victim of terrorism. On the other hand, they're going around using their economic influence in Africa, in the Middle East, and Central Asia, and all the developing Muslim countries to show that they are a counterbalance to uh, American imperialists. Mm -hmm. As such, they should Mm -hmm. be much more trustworthy, and they have the money, they will build the roads, schools, and hospitals, uh, you name it. 
It was American imperialists, one is against Islam, they're fighting, killing Muslim people, therefore you should not trust. And they, they effectively uh, uh, obtained, uh, achieved this um, uh, warmness and goodwill in various developing countries, mainly in Islamic countries. So, so is that whose fault is that? It's, I don't think that anyone should be blamed for it because... Uh, other than China. Here, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a big international conflict is taking place. Uh, a lot of uh, people's lives have been lost, and some governments trying to sort it out, mm -hmm. trying to understand Islam, and understand, try to understand is, uh, Muslim people's resentment on certain international issues, uh, particularly on Middle Eastern issues. And yet, we ha and that this opportunistic government jumps right in, one hand trashes the West, particularly the United States and Muslim countries, and the other hand presented itself as some, some sort of harmless soft power whose purpose only is to invest, build hospitals, and improve the infrastructure of that uh, uh, struggling economies. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so that helped. And then fast forward, we uh, reached to another milestone in 2009, where uh, a, a group of Uyghurs uh, took to the streets to demand uh, justice for uh, a, uh, a factory, a group of factory work workers being uh, brutally killed, beaten up in a Chinese city, where they're working on a Western assembly line, a toy factory. And the Chinese uh, met them with um, uh, uh, heavy machines and uh, and in automatic weapons and killed a lot of people, and the Uyghurs retaliated. There was a big ethnic clash uh, in July 2009. So the Chinese uh, ratcheted up the pressure, uh, promising themselves, um, we're not going to let this happen, even though it's, it is their responsibility to bring justice to those who uh, beaten up some uh, villagers who are just uh, in their tiny uh, cities to make a living. Uh, by working uh, long hours uh, in a poor work condition uh, to make the uh, Western factories rich. Mm. So um, the Chinese not only failed to do uh, what a responsible government would, instead they uh, rounded up people. Uh, we were talking about thousands of people being rounded up, uh, forced disappearance, mm. extrajudicial killing, Mm -hmm. uh, they implemented what's called the execution on the spot policy in 2012. And then that was not even enough. And then uh, during the period of 2012 and 15, some disgruntled Uyghurs uh, used uh, violent message, messages to uh, 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 respond to the Chinese brutality, attack police stations, you know, uh, uh, even... Um, even uh, there is one incident that they they even, they even harmed one pro Chinese government imam, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, the three major incidents took place in China um, uh, during that period. One is a uh, train station attack in a, a city called Kunming, and then there's a uh, uh, ramming through a, 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 a car ran through the uh, uh, public gathered public gathering in Tiananmen Square. And also there was another incident, and then the Chinese uh, tell the world, see, I told you, these are bad people. They tried to uh, commit terrorism on our soil. Mm. And then uh, mm. we heard the news, news of uh, uh, some Uyghurs joining the, uh, uh, I believe, the Al-Nusra force uh, with certain governments that I don't want to name, uh, uh, with the support of some countries uh, in the Gulf, uh, in the Middle East to fight, a, fight against uh, Assad's regime. So that also gave another reason for the Chinese to tell the world that um, there are certain uh, people uh, in the Uyghur societies wanted to be, uh, who are radical uh, terrorists. They wanted to fight um, the West and the Chinese. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, some images being put out uh, by some of those Uyghurs joined the uh, 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 anti-Assad forces, um, mm. with different uh, mm. unconfirmed reports about their affiliation, but most of them, uh, based on reliable information, were aligned with uh, uh, El Nusra, which was supported by uh, Turkey and Qatar. Mm. 
Sorry, um, uh, sorry, Mr. Nuri Tilka, we're just going to have to take a quick ad break. And uh, inshallah, when we come back, I also want to just pose a very uh, a quick question about the World Uyghur Congress that was held a few days ago as well. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. CII. See the whole picture. All right, we are back and we're talking to Mr. Nuri Tarkal all the way in Washington. And um, getting back to, to our very interesting interview about the Uyghurs, of course, and the situation in Uyghur right now. The World Uyghur Congress was held a few days ago and an, 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 an urgency resolution was actually adopted by the European Parliament. Can you, uh, can you basically shed some light on the outcome of that? Thank you very much for asking that question. I, it, is, it is a significant development. Uh, here's why. Since February of this year, we have been um, actively engaged with uh, the United States government and interested parties around the world. Uh, but um, as you uh, viewers can uh, find out or aware of, the United States government is the only one that has been outspoken about this modern-day concentration camp situation in China for the Uyghurs. And the uh, European Union has been very quiet uh, and, and, and in its uh, decision, even at least public uh, statements. So after many months, uh, several months of uh, uh, persistent efforts and lobbying the European uh, Parliament uh, with under the leadership of Uyghur Friendship Group, established in the European Parliament last October. Uh, the public statements being made along with the resolution, which is a, a milestone in uh, the effort to uh, achieve a governmental action uh, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. But um, so far, uh, the EU... And American Parliament, the U.S. Uh, U, uh, US Congress, mm-hmm. have taken a position. And, and surprisingly and sadly and disappointingly, we have not had any Muslim country, any mm-hmm. Muslim country, I need to highlight, underscore this, any Muslim country, with that sizable population, with that specific interest that their religion is under attack in China by this communist regime. And yet no one. God bless Abraham, uh, Enver Ibrahim or, Enver, excuse me, uh, Enver Ibrahim of Malaysia, uh, who is the uh, prime minister in waiting, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. have spoken out uh, and expressed concern. And uh, God bless his efforts, but he is the only one so far. Mm. Uh, and no one, no one in the Middle East, no Saudi king, no Turkish president, no Egyptian president, none. none. Uh, this is mind-boggling. Anyone, I, I don't understand uh, the, why there's no outreach. If somebody calls you religion as a mental disease, what does it tell you? What does it tell you about this country, this government, and the people who run the government? What kind of future that you want to have for your religion, for your children, when a government waiting to be a superpower in the world, challenging the United States, challenging the liberal order, exporting authoritarian regime, and establishing a total surveillance police state? and maybe even coming to South Africa very soon. What does it tell you at what more that the Chinese government needs to do to get your attention? Mm. You know, Western governments do something, especially the United States, uh, speak out on behalf of the Uyghur Muslims or the Kosovo Muslims and Bosnian Muslims in the historic uh, time. Uh, people are very dubious and, and skeptical uh, and start questioning about motive. Oh, yes, uh, if that you're concerning about the motive, why don't you do something? For example, the countries like Saudi Arabia has a strong influence, almost as, 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 as important, as significant as the European Union and the United States. As you know that the Chinese 
heavily depend on Saudi uh, resources, mm-hmm. uh, particularly mm-hmm. oil. Mm-hmm. And Saudi Arabia is one of the uh, uh, import uh, export partners for the Chinese government, as many uh, developing countries. So some people are afraid of speaking out against Chinese out of concern that it will hurt the trade relationship or economic relationship. In fact, it helps the relationship. The world needs to understand the Chinese government is not an ordinary government. Mm. This is not a normal government. This is not a yes. healthy government with a healthy goal mindset. When you look at the initiative, uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is reaching all the way to Africa, I'd like to warn you, my African friends listening, listen to this show. Chinese mm-hmm. are coming. We don't want you to be in the same situation as we are. That's how they come to our homeland. That's how they came with a smile, with the tools, with a so-called good intention to help to develop, develop our country. Look where we are today. Mm. The world needs to wake up. Day before yesterday, U.S. Vice President delivered a very powerful speech. Even the United States is waking up to this potential threat called People's Republic of China or Xi Jinping's China. Even the United States, the, the most powerful country with the most powerful economy and the military, is waking up to this reality. When will you wake up? Your religion is under threat. Your brothers and sisters, Muslim brothers and sisters, have been, uh, been subject to uh, 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 torture, denunciation of their religion, Allah renunciation Allah. of their religion. Mm. And their religion is being called mental disease. Mm. Their woman has been sent to the Chinese uh, 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 men to force to, to make babies with them. The mm. Chinese man is sleeping 70, 80 years old Uyghur Muslims' bedrooms. Where is the outrage? They're replacing Crescent Star on the top of the mosque with a red flag. They're making the Uyghurs to worship in the mosque to the red flag. There's a huge, giant red flag in the mosques. Do you have to... It's against the Islamic faith. You don't worship an image. There's a pictures of Xi Jinping in the mosques. I know the situation is very, very bad because, up? like That's I said, we, we've been doing um, uh, an entire week on Uyghur alone and updates, of course. And I know, like, we've been watching some of the videos as well, you know, where they've been forced to eat pork and, and of course, uh, drink alcohol and all of these things. And it's really, really absolutely sad. It's absolutely critical. But I do, you know, I would love to chat to you a bit more, um, uh, Mr. Nurita Kal, but unfortunately we have run out of time right now. So, any final words that you would love for our listeners to, of course, you know, take heed? Any any final words that you want to, to share with us all here in South Africa? I First of all, pray for your Uyghur Muslim brothers and sisters. And then ask your government I think South African government is in the best position. It is a democratic country. And also, South African brothers and sisters, you've seen this before. You know how it is when the foreign occupiers try to destroy your culture, try to destroy your way of life, try to diminish your dignity, try to take away the God-given rights from you. You know how it works. Please Mm -hmm. reach out to your government. Please reach out to your, uh, government, uh, the governments that you have a contact, We you have a communal access in other Muslim countries. Your mm-hmm. government should be a model in Africa, considering the historic background, to speak out. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that you're spending this whole week covering the Uyghur issues. I, uh, I commend you and your colleagues. And I really, really thank you for your listeners to uh, allow me to share my experience and my uh, 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 concerns Mm -hmm. that I have been expressing in the media, Western media. Mass murder is a possibility Mm -hmm. because no one is coming out of those uh, concentration camps. Mm. Yes, Jazakallah Khair for your time. 
And indeed, we will be making lots and lots of du'a. We are in their du'as, of course. CII Radio, the media voice with a global footprint. Tune in now.